was a jet engine work? Oh. How wondrous is what we eat? How are you? Oh. Have a complete washout. Uh, you can't have a washout, Gail. You can be a washout. Yeah, uh, Fred, you'd know all about that, wouldn't you? Or is that washed up? Oh, oh. kitty! <laughs> Wounded as if I've been hit by a cannonball. <laughs> so unkind. I'm actually talking about when you're rinsing a bottle out at the sink. But what's the fastest way of getting the water out of the bottle? Any ideas, Jones? Uh, I think you probably need to put energy into the system if you shake the water out of okay. something. Okay. No, 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 no. Slow and steady, just like me, so you don't glug. Right, we're going to have a little race here. Okay. On the count of three, we're all going to see who gets the water out of the bottle the fastest. Okay. One, two, three. Oh, we are. Slow and Come steady on, does it every on, time. Out. Nice Come and on. steady. And I think I'm on, probably in the lead. I think as you'll speak. find that nice in about steady. three seconds, oh, my bottle will be completely out. empty. Oh, just, Gareth. But I did beat you. And my water came out much faster because what I did at the top was just spin it around like that and you can see in the middle you get this it's like a spiraling vortex so air rushes in and the water rushes out and that's the fastest way of getting water out of a bottle and that's how you can have a complete washout how does a jet engine work i've nearly finished gareth <laughs> <laughs> Oh, better late than never. Sorry, you were saying. <laughs> How does a jet engine work? Now, jet engines are usually huge devices which power jet aircraft and ocean-going liners. But I've got a model of one here which should explain how the thing works. Here's a jet engine. This is the front and this is the back. Now, at the front, the air is sucked in by this, which is a set of blades called a compressor. Now, that compressor then crushes the air. And in the centre here, you've got the injectors. I can show you on the inside bit here like this. Now, these injectors squirt fuel in and mix it with the air. That's then heated up and it starts to expand. Now, it can't expand in this direction because the case of the motor is in the way. It can't expand in this direction because you've got air rushing in. So it comes rushing out of the back. And what that does is move the jet engine forward and anything that it's attached to. Here's the clever bit now. At the back of an engine, you've got a turbine, a set of blades like this, and that's spun round by the fast air moving out of the back, and what that does is drive the compressor at the front, which draws more air in, so the whole thing works as a cycle. It's basically a very simple machine. Maybe simple, but the real ones are massive, very complicated, cost millions. That's true. You know what? Well, I've got a confession to make. Well, this isn't a model jet engine. Get this off. is the you smallest working production jet engine in the world. And here in the How To Studio is the man who designed it, Mike Murphy from Wren Engines. Mm. Mike, welcome to How To. Hello, Gareth. Is that right? Is this really the smallest? No, I'm sorry to say that we actually have been working on uh, a much smaller engine, and here it is. This one's uh, currently just going into production now. And uh, you use them for driving ready-controlled aircraft around the sky, do you? That's right, yes. This engine will suit this uh, airframe. And uh, that's quite a, a big aircraft, isn't it? Uh, no, not by model terms. It's actually quite a squeeze to get everything to, uh, to go into this aircraft. But we can expect very, very good performance. And um, we would be quite disappointed if we didn't manage 200 miles an hour wow. from this aircraft. That's producing quite a bit of power, isn't it? Well, we're going to see just exactly how much power these motors produce because we've got one attached to a skateboard over here. And here is uh, Roger Parrish, who's going to help us start the motor. Now, I'm going to put on a safety helmet to protect my ears because it makes an awful lot of noise and also to protect my head because I'm going to ride this board. Now the guys will start the motor. The guys are happy that the temperature and the speed of the engine is stable. I'm going to get on the board. Now it should produce enough power to drive me across the studio. You notice we've got a safety tether as well because this is a little bit dangerous. Okay, guys, go! It's doing 150,000 runs per minute. How about that? 
and produces about 40 newtons of power. Now, we couldn't really let that engine go at full speed here in the How To Studio. There just isn't enough room. But the guys have been testing that skateboard and that jet motor at their factory in Yorkshire. And as you can see, it works beautifully. It drove that board along at a real speed. So how does the jet engine work? Well, very well indeed, thanks to Mike and Roger of Ren Turbines. Great stuff. How are you? How are you? Well, I'm glad you asked, actually, Fred, because I'm not feeling too good today. I'm very sorry to hear that, Gail, but I can diagnose exactly what's wrong with you in exchange for, say, a small fee of five pounds. Oh, I just so happen to have a fiver on me. There you go. Thank you. And uh, a drop of blood. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, I wouldn't give it... it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Small point. Just look in a westerly direction and sign your signature, would you? West. Thank you very much. What yes. are you up to this time, Dianich? You do that, and I'll produce my magical machine, the dynamizer. Wow. And that'll work out exactly what's wrong with you. There's my signature. There's your signature, thank you. I'm now going to stick it on a perfectly healthy human being. That's you, Gareth. Yep. Would you please face also in a westerly direction? I thought you might say that. I'm going to attach the sensors from my dynamizer to you. And let's just see what's happening on the dial here yes much as i thought 3.5 it says gail i can confidently predict and diagnose that you've got a nasty case of dry rot dry just rot? try a little sip of water now <laughs> tell me how do you feel he's getting very strange fred I feel so much better. Why hasn't this caught on? <laughs> Wonderful acting. Well, in 1916, strangely enough, thanks to Dr. Alfred Abrams, it did because he claimed he'd got thousands of very satisfied customers. However, two other doctors decided they'd put him to the test and they sent him some blood to diagnose. He said the blood came from a person suffering from rotten teeth and bad sinuses. In fact, the blood had come from... A chicken no. rumbled. <laughs> rumbled. He was exposed as a fake with fake machinery just like mine. But of course, to this very day, people still claim they've got health aids and supplements which make them feel better, and maybe they do, but unless they've been clinically tested properly, there's no way of proving that one way or t'other. So, how are you? Well, I'm fine, except I'm a fiver poorer now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel baffled. <laughs> How wondrous is food? Oh, that lasagna Fred made last night. Oh, don't remind me. It wasn't wondrous. It was awful, really, Fred. I mean, thank you, but... It was extremely average, if you ask me. But I've got something that's far more than average. This being the 21st century and everything having designer labels, I sort of got to thinking, why not have designer food? Yes. Well, I've rustled a few bits up. And take a look at that. Stonehenge. S Stonehenge. Bangers I'm... and mash a la class, Gail. A la class, even. A la class. What is it is? Is really mash? It's bangers and mash, the mashed potato... I just put some green food colouring in, and because it's food colouring, it's edible, obviously, and completely tasteless, so that makes your, your grass, and then you put your sausages around, you support them with cocktail sticks in the middle, and I think you'll agree that is indeed a thing of huge architectural importance. It's also my supper. <laughs> <laughs> Tuck in, watch yourself on those cocktail sticks. <laughs> if you thought that was good, cop a load of this. It wow. may just look like a few spring rolls and sesame prawn toast to you, but to me, it says Great Wall of China. China. That's what it says to me, girl. So you build up the wall with the spring rolls and uh, with the sesame prawn toast, you can make the roof of your little watchtowers there. Decorate all around with some bean sprouts and Chinese vegetables for your grass. I bet you're thinking... She can't top that one. No, we're thinking, sadly, she's going to have a job. <laughs> <when you're laughs> well, if you were thinking I can't top it, come over here and have a look at this. Behold, my pièce de résistance, the Leaning Tower of 
pizza. 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 Yeah, we get it. Yeah. Anyway, it's a stack of pizzas with some layers of chips in between to get the separation, all supported with cocktail sticks. It's a great thing to do for parties. And with loads of other monuments and wonders of the world that you can make from food, you could make your very own coconut macaroon Taj Mahal or a pineapple <laughs> pyramid even. The choices are just endless. So that's how wondrous your food can be. That was a tasty one, wasn't it? Cool. I'll say it was. Now, how can you read a dance? What do you mean? You can't read a dance. We could have a dance, Fred, or yes. you can do a dance. But yeah, you can read a dance. There are video games that you play where you have to read a dance. Gareth, those video games are fine, except they only tell you where to put your feet. They oh. don't really explain about writing down a dance. Now, over the years, there have been several systems for doing that, including, in 1928, one that was devised by a Hungarian called Rudolf van Laben, called Laber Notation. And, in its simplest form, it looked like that. That's simple, is it? <laughs> well, actually, it is really, because all of the symbols make it quite clear in which direction you should be moving. Forwards, backwards, to the left, to the right and the diagonals. Oh, yeah. So bearing that in mind, Gail, and also bearing in mind the shading of the shape represents high, medium and low movement, and you start at the bottom, imagine that is your right arm. What are those symbols telling you to do? OK. Uh, well, arm diagonally back, medium height, yes. then out to the right, high and then forwards low so it's doing a circle you've like that. got it you've got it you're ready to move on to something just slightly more complex okay. because here you see we've got four columns now the outside symbols represent your arms your right arm your left arm the two inner columns represent your feet right foot left foot okay so i've got to work that out um yeah. so it's alternating arms and legs go on one forward yes and like, oh, that's walking. You're walking, exactly. Right, now you're ready to move on to the next stage. Bearing in mind here, the length of oh. the symbols dictates how quickly or slowly you should be moving. And again, those four columns, two outside ones for your arms, two inner ones for you're your legs. You're trying to catch me out here, aren't you, Fred? I how bet you don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so they stay together. Yep. Um, short movement, left arm, left leg. Longer movement, right? You got it. So it's like a limp? Yes, it is. Well done. OK. But obviously, for real dance, the symbols become somewhat more complex than that. But it's not just about dancing, because Laba notation can also be applied to sport. I want you to take a look at this memorable World Cup goal in 1978, scored by a Scottish player called Archie Gemmell. There he is now, round one man, round two, wow. round three, closing yeah. in, yeah. and a lovely, lovely goal. Yeah. One of the all-time World Cup great goals. Here it is in slow motion, round his man, inside, through the legs there, cutting in, and a beautiful yeah. dinked goal. <laughs> that goal was such a classic that, in fact, there's a special Laba notation booklet all about it. No, no yes. I think you write a really? book about a goal. Photographs, descriptions, and also the whole goal has been choreographed. As you can see, the symbols somewhat more complex than those that we've been using, and a special column here for the movement of the ball. No. Do you want me to have a crack at that one now? We'll do that one later. <laughs> so, OK, so now we know how to read dance. Should we have a go? Can't wait. Here we go, guys. Here's a dance written out in Laban notation. <laughs> Are you ready? It's Fred's waltz. Oh, Take hey, your positions, Fred. please. Starting stance. Here we go. Left foot forward, right hand high and right. <laughs> right foot back, left arm high and left. Left foot left, both arms forward, middle. Hey. Right diagonal forward, then left diagonal back. Whilst lowering, right arm low, over two counts. And raising left arm high, oh. over two counts. <laughs> Step to the right, left arm low, jump in the star shape. And repeat, hey! so that's how you can read a dance. <laughs> and that is how for now. Right, right friends, your turn. Oh, no. Let's go, boys. 
and how to returns next Friday. But it's time for one of your texts now. It says, could you say a big hello to Barney Hope? It's his birthday day. He's seven, and that's from mum, dad, and brother Alfie. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, mate. 0781 801 4000. That's the text mm. number. But stick around if you're into gaming, because up next, it's Land Jam. And I tell you what, it beats playing by yourself.